Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Mondays at noon. My name is Ken Anderson. I'm the Dean of the Business School of Gonzaga, and welcoming you to uh, the, this programming that we began about a month ago, where we attempt to bring in uh, community and organizational leaders, many of whom are Gonzaga alums, uh, to share their knowledge and their wisdom uh, with the audience, which uh, predominantly would be made up of our students. So uh, a couple of reminders before we begin today. Uh, number one, this is being recorded. Uh, number two, I uh, would ask you to be uh, aware of the status of your mute button and whether or not it is activated or not. Uh, third, uh, if you have questions uh, today, please submit them via the chat function. And when we're done with today's guest, uh, I will also be around for questions and answers, uh, should you have any for me as Dean of the School. And then lastly, uh, a moment of reflection. Uh, we always begin this program with, with a, a pause for reflection and ask that uh, we just take a moment and think about those who are suffering uh, as a result of the pandemic and perhaps how we can reach out and make things better for those around us. Thank you. So I'm really pleased to uh, introduce our guest today, uh, Katie Bruya. Uh, she is Senior Vice President HR for Washington Trust Bank, uh, a member of our Executive Council here in the Business School, as well as a member of the HR Advisory Board. And I've known Katie for many <laughs> years and just want to thank her for taking the time to uh, be with us here this afternoon. So thank you, Katie. Absolutely. So perhaps we can start, uh, you can tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. So I went to undergrad somewhere else. Don't hold it against me. I'm an Eastern Eagle from way back when, and I majored, actually started out in elementary education, which is funny because I have small kids at home and now I'm using the two classes I took in elementary education because I'm now a homeschooling parent. And this morning I had to take a break and go help my fifth grader with the science project with vinegar and a balloon and baking soda. So it all comes, or all those classes become useful, I guess. But I quickly switched to business as I had always had an affinity to business. Um, and at age 19, you know, you go to college to explore, right? So um, switch to business and switch to HR. And I'm probably one of the few HR people that actually majored in HR and is still in it however many years later that's been, 28 years later, 25 years later since I graduated from college, I guess. Um, and so I, I like it a lot. I like the diversity of it. And I knew that was the major for me because it blended the people side of the business and the business. And I think some people think it's mutually exclusive and the right businesses know that it's not. You have to know how to manage the balance sheet and the employee population. So I ended up um, with an internship in college that went my senior year that went past college and then um, was recruited to go work at a staffing firm and did some work there, a couple different opportunities. Was on the um, sales side for a little while, which was good to get that background. Um, then in the late 90s, I'm dating myself, but I went to work at Gonzaga and met several long standing friends that I'm still in contact with today from there, from 1995 to 2000. And then in 2000, uh, went to Washington Trust Bank. Had to be recruited there. I thought banking was kind of boring and stoic and regulated, and sometimes it is those things. But also it's uh, the power broker of the economy. And I loved having to be able to work at an, in an institution that can have an impact on the economy at large within our communities. That was really um, compelling to me and was promoted to the director role in 2005 and have been there ever since. Thank you. So, and have an um, MBA. Sorry, I forgot the most important part. The MBA was also, of course, done in the late 90s at Gonzaga at night. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, so 
before we move on to what, you, what your role currently involves, uh, it is obviously a senior level role, more of a generalist uh, position. But when I recall you were at Gonzaga, you were the compensation specialist. Right, right. So I have a background in recruiting and then in comp benefits and HRIS. When I was at Gonzaga, I was in charge of the human resources information system or HRMS as a lot of people call it and comp. So you learn comp strategies, you learn how to do metrics and analysis from your data from the HRMS um, and combine those together to provide those to management to make good business decision, business decisions. So what does what your uh, job look like currently? Well, pre-pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> pre-pandemic. Pre yes, my, my normal job, my day job, yeah. yeah. So I supervise all those distinct areas of HR. I have an employee relations team. I have a recruiting team. I have a compensation benefits group. Um, and then uh, internal communications person, which can or cannot be in HR. Sometimes that varies by company. And then also a small training group as well. And we do mostly leadership training on our side. We have a skills-based training group report up through um, someone else on the line for teaching job skills like teletraining, new accounts, that sort of thing. So we do the leadership piece mostly. Okay, and, and to give the audience uh, a sense of scale, uh, how many people in HR at Washington Trust? Including the people on the training side and that communications person, we have 15 and we have 1,100 employees in three states okay. total. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pre-pandemic, biggest challenges in your job? I would say the biggest challenge was recruiting really good talent. Um, our industry is known to be very stable. We still have a pension. It's closed to new entrants, but it still exists for um, longer term employees. We are known as an industry that doesn't lay people off. So there's, it's really appealing to certain people who seek that, but sometimes generational, generationally speaking in younger groups, we're not known to be innovative. You know, people don't think of financial institutions as cutting edge and using innovation. They wanna go high tech, they wanna to go to a bigger city. So a lot of it was a challenge, A, getting people in Spokane, that once you get them here, they love it and never leave, and they understand why it's kind of the best kept secret of the Northwest. And B, really getting new talent to be really innovative and current employees to think innovatively because it's a very structured, regulated industry. So we can't have a bunch of renegades that, you know, we can't hire a bunch of people who would fit really well at Facebook because they would just button up against audit internal audit, external examiners, et cetera. And you have to have a structured kind of mindset to do well in this industry and not violate the myriad of laws that are out there. But at the same time, you do want someone who can come in and be creative and innovate new products. So that's been kind of a push-pull tension for us and probably for lots of banks. Okay, cool, cool. So let's talk COVID-19. <laughs> yes. Uh, and not necessarily Washington Trust, uh, but as someone with tremendous experience in HR and, and, and you sit down and, and you think, and I'm sure sometimes you, you worry and you stress about the challenges presented by the pandemic, what sort of uh, challenges do you think about? So the first two to three weeks were really intense and we were fortunate that the west side had it first even though we have locations over there so we were still thick in it you know our friends at microsoft and amazon were sending people home right away all of those things that we saw happening so um we worried a lot about obviously the safety and health of our employees and customers comes first right there's no amount of business that's worth having someone get sick or pass away from it. So everything we went into was how do we protect our employees? How do we protect our customers? 
And because we are a bank and obviously an essential business, how can we still meet the needs of those customers? We need to be there for them. And those first couple of weeks, our branches were flooded with individuals wanting to pull out all their cash, right? Human behavior sometimes is not rational and nobody has a playbook. Well, we have a playbook now, but at the time, nobody had a playbook for this level of, of a pandemic since we hadn't seen it since 1918. So we're managing society and we're monitoring the sentiment of customers and employees and families. They're, you know, making a run on the bank, pulling their cash, sticking it in their, under their mattress, buying toilet paper and goods and all that, right? So we're managing way more than just you would normally think would happen in a quote regular HR department or even as, a, as an executive committee member because there's so many outside factors coming in. But really what this pandemic has done is created many changes, I'm sure you've heard this from others and you certainly will if you haven't, in how we work and how we interact with each other. And there are, were, there are a lot of great lessons to be gained uh, from that that came out of this, along with a lot of stress. Okay, okay. Uh, picking up on something you mentioned, uh, you use the term playbook. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know some organizations uh, literally have exercises where the top leadership is all of a sudden uh, and surprised with a scenario that they are given. Uh, I know our friend Scott Ma, when he was at Starbucks, would talk about uh, their crisis planning exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, Washington Trust do anything like that? Absolutely. So we have a team called the Incident Response Team, the IR team. We used to call it Crisis Response, and then we decided to change it because not everything's a crisis. Sometimes it's just an incident, and you still need to meet and go through the process. So the IR team kind of manages the overall piece and there's a sub team that is just for communication, but the IR team is the team in charge. And we have every business leader, every department has a disaster um, recovery or business continuity plan. I have one on my shelf here at home because we always want to keep one that's off site, right? So we had all of these things prepared and we do tabletop exercises every uh, six months four to six months. So as a group, we'll come and we'll, we'll do a hypothetical, like let's say there's an earthquake in Seattle. What do we do? What are the steps? Let's say the train that runs through downtown falls off the tracks and now there's something that's spilled and has destroyed downtown and all of our buildings are impassable. So we've gone through these exercises several times, but I'm sure I wouldn't be the first to tell you that no matter how many times you do a tabletop exercise, and we did one for COVID in February, we did an example where, and those of you in Spokane will laugh because you know this is kind of true. We have an employee who's married to a person who was the marshal um, in the hospital when those first four people came off the cruise ship and um, were put into Sacred Heart Hospital. You know, It's the two degrees of separation that is Spokane. So we did that in February and kind of went through an exercise. Now what happens if we have this many cases, et cetera. But no matter how much you do that, you're still gonna say, oh shoot, <laughs> you're gonna have lots of meetings every day, didn't expect this to happen, okay, now what do we do? And it moves much faster many times, other times a little bit slower. So even though we had our playbook, we have our beautiful little business continuity plans, we still basically those first couple weeks of March sat in, in the boardroom for 20 hours that week, our two hour meetings went four to five hours a day and, and started implementing and getting everything ready. Um, and it was an interesting exercise. And we literally do have a playbook and that's what we call it. I have a manager's playbook where I speak directly to leaders. Um, and then we have an overarching incident response team playbook. And, and in there, it's all the categories of all the areas you have to think about and all of the HR pieces of which there are many, the facilities, the customers, the buildings, you know, security, everything. So I'm hoping we never have to use it again, but it's all there now should we need to. Wow. So the biggest <laughs> surprise, you already mentioned uh, people coming into the banks and, and, or to the branches and, and wanting their money. Uh, was that the biggest surprise on the customer side? Um, 
That's a great question. No, and, and even though our president had been in the paper saying your cash is safe, you don't need to go grab lots of cash, people still did. I think the biggest surprise we had a couple different locations, we have 40 locations throughout Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. And the biggest surprise was someone would come in and say, yeah, I just got tested positive for COVID. Who knew? And you think, really? Why are you walking around? And they're, you know, so I know I've been in HR a long time and I've always said people never cease to surprise me, but that kind of surprised me. And that happened probably a handful of times people coming in. And then of course the employees are just calling, freaking out. So you know, why aren't people using common sense and staying away when they're sick? And this was well before the stay at home bans and all of that. So that kind of surprised me a little bit from customers. But overall, our reputation, thankfully, is really good. So when customers would call, you know, they trust us and we could assuage their concerns. Um, but at the same time, you know, the pandemic and your physical health issues going on, the financial health is happening as well, right? A lot of our wealth management customers just watched their portfolios tank along with the rest of the world. So they have that stress they're bringing on. So there's a lot of outreach and being responsive to people calling to work through all of those fears. I mean, people were under a lot of stress, physical, financial, emotional, it's intense. Yeah. Okay. So looking toward the future and whatever the new normal looks like and whenever we get there, <laughs> uh, what, what's in your crystal ball as far as changes with how we work? Yeah, so we, the incident response team meets daily and we're talking about re-entry, what re-entry looks like for us. Um, and it'll be phased, it'll be, we'll keep, we, we, let me back up, originally, early on, we went in and segmented our employees, and we had them self-identify if they were high risk based on the CDC guidelines at the time that were listed, which had been slightly modified. So instantly, I had a group of my population that I knew needed to not be in contact with anybody. Conversely, those individuals will be the last to go on site where they're gonna have contact with other people. So they're last to leave this remote work site. But the question is, well, we've proven we can be remote and it works. Should we go back just because we can? And there's a lot in that question because we're very much a relationship-based business. People want to see their banker and look them in the eye and talk to them. And we tend to also hire people that want to interact with other people and introverts. And I have many that work for me are thriving in this environment and they love it. And some of us extroverts hate it. We, we appreciate the peace and quiet and getting things done and some other ancillary benefits that come with that. Like I haven't worn high heels or business suit in you know, a month, but we need that social interaction and business is easier. I'm, I mean, I get there's a lot of remote work experts out there and, and they talk about the value of it, but it is just easier to have six people at a table than six people in Zoom, right? You're not talking over each other, you, you get body language, all those things. So when we look at how will work be done, we're looking at what jobs really worked well remotely, maybe accounts payable, roles like that, that you don't really have a lot of interaction. If you do, it's over the phone and that's great. And then we'll start looking at who we bring back on site, what that looks like. And during the pandemic, of course, we anticipate it'll be required social distancing so we can only bring back enough that can fit into the office space six feet apart, et cetera. And I think about the commercial real estate space, what does that look like? If people, if businesses say, my entire call center worked really well from home, why do I need to rent this massive building to have a bunch of cubicles in there? So I think the, everyone's gonna ask these questions. But one thing that I think people aren't thinking about is, okay, we worked remotely because we were all on a conference call, all 12 of us. But what happens when nine of us are on in person and two are on the conference calls and we've all been in meetings like that. And those two people kind of get left behind because you kind of forget about them. They can't hear because everyone's talking over each other. Um, there's always the meeting in the hallway that happens after. So you have to train people to not do that anymore because then the people on the phone miss it, right? So as much as people will say, hey, remote work worked, we can do this. I think they have to remember it worked when 100% of the people were remote. It's very different when only half or a third are, and you still have to adjust your style. And that has to be very intentional and conscientious. 
Um, so I think it'll be tricky for people to do that. And I think the norm, you know, psychologically, do we want to be normal or have we learned that maybe we should all just take a deep breath and not over schedule ourselves. And that's more for the psychology majors, I suppose, but that still comes into play a bit on the business side. Absolutely. Because of um, your employee base and kind of meeting them where they are. I think about um, candidates as well. You know, how do they apply remotely? What does that look like? How do they start new jobs when they never got to meet anybody? They didn't get to have new higher orientation in person. It was all done electronically or over videos. It's a very different experience. And I think companies that are successful like we were, we went from an average of 60 remote tokens a day to 700. Um, we were successful because we have that face-to-face -face history with each other. I'm not sure, and others would have to speak to this, if you could hire 100 people a week and, and merge them into that culture and they would still be as, as successful, not having that face-to-face -face history with somebody. That's something right. that I think about a lot. Okay. That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's interesting when you when you really dive in and start <laughs> thinking about uh, a workplace or an organization or an experience. I know I, I read something this morning or yesterday about uh, going back to sporting events, mm. and of course everybody thinks about well, will there be temperature checks on the way in and will there be social distancing with the seating? But this one article I read brought up the notion of the hot dog person at Dodger Stadium. And will we ever again pass hot dogs down the row and pass the money back? Right. Right. Any, any, does that, that level of detail uh, propped any thoughts in, in your world? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, well, it's kind of like the New York governor was talking about having baseball come back without fans, but ticket revenue is a big piece of their business, right? So they have to change their whole business model if they're gonna pay players without revenue coming in, except TV ads or whatever that really um, contract work. So yeah, we've talked a little bit about that. Our product is mostly a service outside of branches where you are touching debit cards and you're printing, handing them checks and printing new cards and that sort of thing. For the most part on the lending side, it's handing some paperwork over and some face-to-face um, -face conversations. But yeah, we've talked about that. A real tactical example would be printing. Um, we were we looked at our goal was to get everybody out of our buildings as much as possible outside of the branch we, we did other things there but for the downtown headquarters finance hrit execs all that get them out lenders etc so when we looked at what brought them back in it was well i had to print well i had to get a wet signature because the examiners the regulators require it or I don't know how to use DocuSign, so this is just how I've always done it. So we, I do think we'll absolutely gain some benefits in being more efficient. We will have DocuSign and get automated signatures where we can. Um, will the lender have the documents printed from our loan service center and drive them out and say, hello, Dr. Anderson, nice to see you. Let's go to a coffee shop and meet and you sign or I give you your stuff, whatever. Again, that high touch piece, because it's a high touch relationship business. But yes, we absolutely, could just email you a secure email that's encrypted and send you your document. So we do think about that piece where you're not touching things and you're not printing and you're doing them as remotely as possible. And will that change the relationship? Would that then make us feel kind of like any big bank that's based out of somewhere five states away and you lose that touch? So we're trying to balance right. that piece. Right. Interesting, because one, one company that just popped into my head, thinking about the whole notion of not needing commercial real estate, mm -hmm. and this is a, an extreme example, but Blockbuster, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, their whole business model disappeared right. because I didn't have to go to the store anymore to get a movie. Uh, yeah. Well, that'll be interesting. So 
you're you're so good with our students and you've been so gracious with your time uh over and over and over um what what would you tell uh a student at gonzaga today so i would say some of the same things i had said before leverage that alumni network get names of people in fact, I just told this to someone I'd met with maybe January, February, I, before I worked out of, the, out of my home office. If you want to live in San Francisco or you want to work in this industry, get the alumni at network. Call Susie Johnson, who's a Gonzaga grad, and say, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm a Gonzaga grad or a soon-to-be grad. Because the minute you drop the Gonzaga name, there's such an affinity there and such a strong community they will take your call. And that puts you way up here above the stacks of applications from everyone else. So you call, you say, I'm only gonna take 10 minutes of your time. And then you honor that and you only take 10 minutes of their time and you make that connection. So that happens pandemic or not, right? Drop Gonzaga's name, leverage your alums because they want to help you because they love Gonzaga. And that data is there in Banner and the right people can get it to you in any city you wanna go, you can find an alum or you can search LinkedIn on your own and do it. What I would say to seniors right now is first of all, I am really sorry. I am so sorry that your senior year, which is supposed to be so fun and great and exciting as you're launching into the world and maybe even skipping a class now and then, even MBA students did that and having fun with your friends, I'm sorry that's not happening or that it's happening from six feet away or electronically because that's a really big takeaway and that is something to genuinely grieve your senior year being done this way. That being said, doesn't mean you're not hireable. It doesn't mean you don't bring a lot to the table. Um, and you know what, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it and you will find a way because you are a Zag to make it work and maybe you'll get really creative like you'll post a video on LinkedIn so people can see how you present yourself and how you communicate. Maybe you'll embed that in an email when you follow up from an application. You will find creative ways to get in front of people even when you can't literally get in front of them. I think another takeaway or, or a, an unfortunate circumstance of this is the internship pieces. You know, we hire lots of interns every summer and we cut that program down to about 5% of what it used to be because we just didn't have the bandwidth to orient, onboard, and train interns when we already have full staff, some of whom aren't fully leveraged for whatever reason that can fill, you know, they can chip in and fill out another areas or pitch in and fill out another area. So some of those internship opportunities may be lost for students. So they just have to get, again, really creative on that. But also I would say students bring to the table what a lot of employees don't already possess, and that's experience with technology or maybe even a better intuition with technology. So leverage that, create an internship where you say, I can go around and teach people how to use these tools or how to continue to use the tools they limped along with in March and April, and now we're gonna really leverage it. Go be the DocuSign expert, whatever. Find creative ways to say, hey, there's a bunch of 50 year olds that are working very differently now that they're not used to. I can come in and help with that. So I think it still, even though the pandemic is unfortunate and there's a lot of things that are just such a bummer about it, it's also opportunity, right? That's where everybody gets their best in innovations is out of an opportunity. So I think the Zags are smart and clever and they will find a way to turn this challenge into an opportunity and leverage it for themselves. Cool. That's my thought. That's great advice. And I also know that Katie's uh, number one or number one A rule would also be <laughs> always follow up with a handwritten thank you note. Yes, it's true. It's, <laughs> everybody emails. People get buried in email. But if you want to impress me, send me a handwritten note. The problem is <laughs> I can't release my home address, so you just have to send it to the office. But someone will find it eventually. No, there's people open email. So we've got a question for you. Uh -oh. uh, so what a, what a student suggested that organizations uh, <laughs> may use the pandemic uh, to flip over their workforce from an older workforce to a younger workforce, old blood, new blood. How, how do you see organizations balancing 
uh, bringing back uh, experienced workers versus bringing in that, that new blood. I mean, organizations always face that tension. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you see the pandemic uh, presenting any special challenges in that way? Well, yes, and even though I did it, hopefully with a bit of a caveat, not every 50-year-old can't use technology, and not every millennial can, but I use that as a generational stereotype to show what you bring to the table, right? right. I think if companies really intentionally flip their, <laughs> their employee population, they're going to find some, they're going to find themselves on the end of some demand letters from plaintiff's attorneys because right. um, for them to just say, eh, you're expensive, you're old, you kind of fumbled around using Cisco WebEx on our meetings, we're going to replace you the 22 year old, A, you're throwing a lot of experience out the door and putting, putting a lot of, of gamble on that young inexperienced person, but B, that's going to be really hard to prove that's not age discrimination. Um, mm -hmm. You have to train your people to use the new tools that they're required to use, right? And you still have to manage through that. And you still have to manage performance. And that was a lot of things we had as HR. I told the managers, you don't just get a pass. I don't want your employees thinking there's some sort of tacit agreement that even though I was being coached to perform better right before I was sent home, that's off the table because now it's just about surviving the pandemic. No, you're still held accountable to do your job. You still have to meet those those agreements, um, you're just doing it remotely. So that still is there. Um, so I would hope companies don't use this as a, an opportunity for a wholesale change. Now, what they might use it, maybe this is the intent of the question, is an opportunity for people to really shine who maybe didn't have that opportunity before because the, the employee didn't embrace remote technology or didn't really appreciate technical skills. So maybe that's an opportunity for a new breed of, of employees to come in and say, I can help with this because I'm experienced with it and you could benefit from my expertise. I'm sure there's value in that for sure. Okay. Let, let me, uh, let me spin that, that question, uh, just a little bit. Uh, do you see, and again, not, not necessarily Washington trust. Do you anticipate an exodus of folks by their own choosing, uh, who are around retirement age because of the pandemic? That is a great question. And I would say no, because their 401ks were decimated. Okay. If anything, they look at that going down 30%, probably less than that because they're not heavily invested in equities, but going down dramatically, and that will have a direct impact on when they are leaving. Um, okay. I do think people might leave because of the pandemic for other reasons maybe right. having their kids home they say i really want this i also think we're gonna have a lot of really engaged employees who say yeah i want to work <laughs> not be at home all day and i say that tongue in cheek of course <laughs> right. um but yeah you could see both sides of that coin right I, i've seen it just even with my friends some of us say and granted my kids are not preschool so it's different it's easier they're 10 and 12. And we say, this is great. I can go downstairs, have lunch with my kids, and they're pretty independent on their school stuff, and it's awesome. And I have friends that are working with a four-year-old. They're just like, oh, I'm going nuts. I need to get back to the office. I need a babysitter. I cannot do this. I'm so glad I have a career. So everyone's kind of finding that space or reconfirming um, their beliefs, perhaps, from, from earlier in their career. But yeah, I think retirees aren't going to be heading out the door because the financial piece is, is really hard. And you know, the pundits say globally, it could be a three year recovery to get all the way back to where we were. You know, it's gonna be a hard 12 months and then another 24 months after that to really get us back. That's a long time. That is a long time. Kind of depressing. So uh, here's another question from a student. Uh, let's say you were talking to college senior Katie <laughs> or let's say your kids were uh, 10 and 12 years <laughs> older than they are, uh, what advice would you give students about how to use this time to develop their skills above and beyond what they're learning in class? Is online development, yeah. any skills or things 
that would make them more marketable. You've mentioned DocuSign, uh, et cetera, but, but what else comes to mind? That is a great question. Um, someone told me Harvard Business School is offering some free classes. Um, I've heard people talk about the masterclass opportunity for 100 bucks, and you can get a certificate um, that you could show somebody. So I think if you have the time and the access to the technology to do it, you could definitely improve some skills and get some certifications and things to add to your resume. Um, I think you would need to convince employers because there's still a lot of relationship-based businesses out there that um, you can do all of these things on technology but still communicate well, whatever uh, medium that looks like. So if you typically can communicate really well one-on-one, -on -one, but a crowd makes you nervous, this is a great opportunity to practice public speaking because you're staring at yourself on a monitor watching yourself speak. So you video that perhaps, and then you learn about yourself and how you present and all the weird ticks that you do and all the, the ohms and ums and, uh, and twirling your hair, whatever, right? So presentation skills are always able to be sharpened and that's a great and easy thing to do during this downtime that you can then bring to the table. So when you are called in to interview or you're called in for that promotion or you're called in to go land that big client, you've got it because you have the presentation skills and the communication skills and maybe even the writing skills. You could improve your writing skills at this time as well. I think those would be areas I would focus on. And those were areas that we were helping our employees with pre-pandemic because you can be really, really smart but if you're socially awkward or you can't communicate well and no one's gonna see that, it's not gonna get you anywhere. Conversely, I've seen some people that probably don't have the best intellectual capacity, but they are so charming and effusive and can sell snowflakes in hell that they get really, really far in life. So I can't preach enough that presentation communication piece and this would be a great opportunity to improve that because what else do you have to do after five o'clock or on Saturdays, right? You're not going right. anywhere. <laughs> Exactly. You might as well record yourself. Any other comments for the, for our students? Anything else come to mind? Um, I would say, hang in there. Use this as an opportunity. This is going to be something you'll remember forever, right? You were a college student during the pandemic. The biggest thing we've had outside of the Great Recession. Um, and the de depression since 1918 Spanish flu. So I would say leverage this time, take advantage of it. I told my HR team this the other day in our daily huddle. Some days feel really long. You know, the days, are, the days can be long and kind of draining and kind of lonely if you're following all the social distancing rules. But it won't be that far down the road when we're gonna look back on this and say, gosh, that kind of went fast. I'm done wearing yoga pants and, and Ugg slippers every day and I'm back to the craziness and you'll love it and you'll be so grateful to just see people but don't discount what you're learning during this time as a student journal I say that all the time and I'm really bad at it but I throw some thoughts on word now and then but write down what you learned from it because I think I would sit there if I were to interview somebody I would say so what did you learn during the pandemic professionally and personally, because I want to get an insight into to what people bring to the table. Because if you can survive the pandemic, let's say you're an extrovert and you survive and you grow emotionally, what a great thing to share with a future employer, because you're going to bring to the table as a future employee, that ability to take something that's hard and overcome it and learn from it and even, oh my gosh, appreciate it. So those pieces that you think don't really matter, really do matter. And write down those things, talk about what you learn and be prepared to answer that in an interview because I would think that's gonna be a big interview right. question. Now that's a, that's a great answer to the question I was just gonna ask you that just came in, last question we'll take. Okay. Student commented, you know, seniors grieving the loss of their senior year, mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, how, can they flip that into a positive in the job search? And, and I think you touched on some of that. Well, just like I said, when you talk about call and say you're from Gonzaga, write your cover letter and say, 
as someone entering the workforce during the greatest pandemic in history, I mean, kind of let, you know, name, name drop COVID a little bit, I guess I say tongue in cheek, because use that to get attention and, and then talk about, here's what I did during this period to grow myself professionally as I prepared to go out into the world. You know, I always talked about, um, I like to see what students do outside of your classes. It's great that your GPA is what it is and all these things, but can you balance a really busy schedule? Can you multitask? Can you prioritize? All those things I'm gonna ask you to do as a future boss. Okay, hey, future employee, can you handle having everything fun stripped away from you? No interaction with your teachers that you really appreciate and respect and that mentor you, sitting in front of a laptop for hours on day, day hours on end in a day, and not end up either gaining 50 pounds or drinking every night, right? Can you survive that? Great, tell me about how you survive that. Tell me how you learn to survive and even thrive. Because if you can do that, you can work for me and this job will be fine. If you can handle COVID, you can handle working at a company. So I would say leverage COVID for what you did and what you learned and use that as your opening statement and get someone's attention. And they'll feel bad for you as a senior in COVID, and they'll call you. I, I would. I would call you. That's great Maybe. advice. Well, as always, Katie, you were, you were incredible. Thank you for taking some time out of your day. Very well. Very, very, very insightful and, and educational, the, the range of things that you talked about. So we're very grateful, uh, again, that you took the time. And... Hope you and the family stay well and safe. And thank you again. You're welcome. Anytime. Happy to help. Okay. Thanks, Have Katie. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.